Welcome to another episode of the Property Nomad podcast. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Neil Whitfield. Neil is the author of the number one Amazon bestselling book, The Ultimate Property Listing, uh, which is packed with practical advice and tips to improve the conversion rate of your existing lettings. So you can effectively convert more instructions, interviewings, sales and lets. Neil has also um, built a lettings agency from uh, standing position, I uh, sold that for a six figure sum, and has also helped uh, numerous companies with successful direct marketing campaigns as well. Really looking forward to this. Marketing is something I know not a lot about. And uh, so, Neil, thank you very much for your time. Hi, Rob. Yep, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Glad to be here. Yeah, really looking forward to this. Uh, it's it's going to be absolutely cracking. Uh, being an author as well, how I'll start with the book aspect of it. How difficult or how challenging did you find it to, to produce a book? Um, I actually quite enjoyed the process. Um, writing is something that I that I like doing, and 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 anyone who's read the book will know that writing plays a big part in in having an effective property listing. So I was quite confident in my abilities to to, to write it. Um, I think where I probably struggled at the start was um, getting a structure. Um, and I knew the book, you know, the book is a means to an end, really. And, and as a marketing person, the book is there to, you know, position me as, as an expert, to obviously to, to help people solve this problem that they have a real need. But I knew that it was going to be a very niche book for a very specific audience. You know, I wouldn't be getting rich on the Amazon royalties. Um, so really, I wanted to write a book that that ticked all those boxes. Um, and, and with that in mind, that, something that I found really valuable, and I recommended it to, to someone on a, on a call earlier on this morning. There is a, a book uh, by a, a, an author called Mike Capuzzi. Um, and it's called The 100 Page Book. And that book, which you can get on Amazon or direct from, from Mike, that book plus another two sort of sister titles really, really, he really helped me to, to format the book, to, to get what was basically an idea in my head onto paper, into, into a structure. And, and he has quite a... Um, uh, a defined sort of structure for for how the book should be should be laid out and and I pretty much follow that I mean ultimately he's he's selling services to do this for you if if you want but but I just used the the structure that was in his three books so each of them are pretty cheap you know under under a tenner so for less than 30 quid I just sort of used everything I could from his books to to uh to help me to to create mine actually writing it I think was was possibly the easiest bit because you know having got the however many I think it's something like 16,000 words or something like that down obviously then the editing process takes time I, I was in the fortunate position that I, I knew through just my own sort of business networking I knew a, pe a few people who were you know professional writers and editors and and, and they were able to proofread it for me but then it's all of the um, the not very interesting stuff, like getting it formatted correctly to get uploaded into Amazon, and it needs to be a different format if you're doing it for Kindle, as if it's a paperback, and all of that sort of not particularly sexy stuff does does sort of take a lot of time. So the book came out in March, and I think I I first actually started doing something with it in earnest, um, probably the, the the summer before. Um, you know, I was doing it in amongst working with other clients and doing other work and things like that. So it wasn't 100% of, of my focus. Um, but probably, well, I, I sort of finished the actual writing of it before Christmas. So if you can imagine, it was sort of from Christmas up until March for all of that other sort of editing, formatting, getting it loaded, getting all the imagery right sort of stuff. But it was, a, you know, it was a really, um, I really enjoyed it as a process overall and I've already got ideas on on what my next one might be uh, good times it's always good to get other people's perspectives that have, have sat down and have written written themselves um, I will 
sort of apologise if people are watching this on YouTube for some reason my shirt is flashing I don't know why <laughs> it's just red but then it's not I really don't know why that's the case uh, podcast listeners don't worry about it it's just really incredibly bizarre um, apologies if you're epileptic I'd probably advise not continuing watching the video <laughs> um, but yeah, so strange apologies about that and then uh, I do not know what's going on there very very weird anyway for people also listening, I, I would point out, I mentioned about um, you know, increasing conversions, getting more sales, getting more leads, etc. For people that are listening to this, it doesn't just apply to your latest agents. If you're self-managing as well, I'm sure there's going to be a plethora of content that Neil's going to go through that is applicable to you as well. So there's stuff here for everyone. Yeah, I mean, what, what I would to, say is that yeah. I did. Yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, I, I, I did write the book aimed at agents, uh, letting agents and estate agents. But as you rightly say, Everything that I talk about applies to if you're self-managing, if you're advertising the property yourself, Gumtree, or you're using one of the, the sites now that allows you to, you know, to post your listings up there. Um, you know, if that's you, then, you know, you can steal a, steal a march. You can get ahead of 99% of agents out there because most of them are, are, you know, not doing everything as, as well as they could do. Equally, if you're, you know, if you're an investor, and you are using agents. I've I've done uh, presentations to investor groups, and it's useful because obviously it allows you to manage your your agent. So, you know, ultimately, if you buy a property, you want it to be rented out as quickly as possible. Or if you've bought it to flip it, clearly you don't want to be hanging uh, it hanging around. So, you know, it puts you in a position of strength so that you can actually say to the agent, well, I've noticed that you're doing X, perhaps you should be doing Y. And, and ultimately, everybody benefits if the property gets sold or, or let quicker, really. So, uh, so yeah, not, not just agents. There's, there's a number of other people who will find it beneficial. Creating those win-win situations, which is you know, the whole point of, I guess, being in business in, in the first place. Neil, if we, if we can just roll back to the very start, uh, so I mentioned in the introduction that you started your own lettings agency and you grew that for 10 years and then sold it. What made you start your lettings agency in the first place? Had you already had previous property experience or were there other factors that got you involved? Yeah, so um, so prior to opening it, I, you know, I hadn't been a letting agent, hadn't been an estate agent. As you said in the intro, my first career, which was sort of 10, 11 years, was in was in marketing, direct marketing. And um, I worked for a number of, well, I, I worked for a couple of big international agencies on some really um, quite sexy clients, you know, Rolls Royce, Energizer, Wilkinson Sword, you know, doing some really, um, some really nice campaigns. A lot of them made a lot of money for the clients. Some of them even won, won some awards. And, and I did well through that, but, um, why did I start my letting agency? It was one of those typical, you know, silly ideas after a glass of wine on a Friday night ideas that, that actually came to fruition. Um, so I'd been in the position where um, when my wife, who I think at the time was my fiance, um, sort of moved in together, we were able to have our properties rented out rather than having to sell them. The agent at the time wasn't doing a particularly good job of the whole process and you know it's one of those i can do a whole load better than that okay go on then uh and i did so that um that meant a sort of upheaval from uh the northwest we were living in cheshire at the time back to my native northeast just because um well there are a number of reasons one of them being the support network um family friends and all the rest of it um but we um moved back up you know, sold that lovely property we just bought down in, in Cheshire to, to, to basically fund the, the scary, risky move into starting a letting agency um, and uh, set up in Sunderland, uh, which is a town I knew. I grew up quite close to that. Um, and uh, because I hadn't had hands on experience of being an agent, um, I chose to go down the franchise route. Uh, so I opened up under a, uh, as a Belvoir franchisee rather than, you know, Neil Whitfield lettings or what have you. One of the key reasons for doing that was um, well, coming from a marketing background, you know, the branding side of things, I think, was was crucial. But also the support and the, the, the legal advice, because, you know, I didn't know one end of a tenancy agreement from the other at that stage. And 
that was, uh, you know, something that I, you know, was, was very keen to, to get their, you know, support and advice and guidance on from, from day one. But yes, yeah, so we opened up in, in 2007, cold start, you know, re off, office premises on estate agents row, two big glass windows with absolutely no properties in them and uh, grew it from there. How did, uh, I mean, just go back to 2007, obviously that's when you can easily argue that the economy sort of went on a knife edge there. Oh yeah. No um, properties to start off with in your windows. How hard was that? Two, two weeks after we opened the credit crunch happened. So that was good. Mm. <laughs> so um, so that, that focused the mind. Um, all of the, you know, the spreadsheets that I'd poured over for, you know, 18 months to get the whole forecast for how fantastic this successful launch is going to be. Well, they just, you know, went up in smoke overnight, basically. Talking about starting in the deep end, eh? Yeah. So, I mean, I've been speaking to people who obviously have been launching businesses, you know, during the pandemic and things. And I've got a lot of, you know, sympathy and I can empathize with what they're going through. It, it was it was a really, really difficult time. Um, in some respects, putting a positive spin on it, had I not done it then, I would have never have been able to do it after that because, you know, the, the, the bank's enthusiasm for lending just completely changed. And, you know, so in, in one sense, I was really lucky that I did manage to, you know, to get in, get all the funding secured, get open before, before the world fell over, basically. But um, it made the first 18 months incredibly difficult because um, you know, we were starting from, from ground zero. Um, in Sunderland, I mean, one of the reasons I chose it as a town was because well, at the time, actually, I think it had the lowest number of estate and letting agents per capita per household, pretty much anywhere. Certainly if you compared it with Newcastle down the road, you know, 40 miles down the road, you know, I did my research back in 2006 or whatever, when the Yellow Pages was still a thing. And, um, you know, there were over 100 letting agents um, in Newcastle at the time. This is back in 2006. There was there were less than 20 in Sunderland. Um, and correspondingly, they had about the same number of, of chimney pots. Um, and at the time, when I did that research, most of the estate agents, established estate agents in Sunderland, didn't touch lettings at all. They were doing fine selling properties, thank you very much, and thought lettings was, you know, too much work for too little money. But obviously, when uh, the credit crunch hit and they found that they couldn't sell anything, uh, they very quickly realised that um, there was a potential income stream from lettings, and they all jumped into lettings. Uh, some of them, you know, with some very aggressive pricing strategies trying to buy the market and uh you know that that made things very challenging i think it, it it focused my mind because um i knew from the start that i wasn't going to be competing on price i was going to be competing on on service and i you know i came from my my business background was more on the sort of client service side you know i wasn't a graphic designer or anything like that um, so I applied the sort of the, the techniques that I'd learned in, you know, providing excellent service to my, you know, business clients, you know, marketing directors and finance directors of, you know, big companies clearly have very high expectations. So I applied all of those skills to, you know, focusing on, on the service and, and thankfully with the backup of, of Belvoir behind me, you know, all of their sort of legal knowledge and expertise was was there available to me as well. So, um, so yeah, it, it it made for a, a a worrying time, but we we came through it. And and then after that, um, I think what it also did, and you you can see it, you know, going through to the advice that I give when I'm working with clients today, or even what's in the book, is it very quickly focused my mind in the fact that you know some of the things that might work for you know big international companies with you know hundreds of thousands of pounds if not millions of pounds to spend don't work for a little business and uh it very quickly sort of made me reassess what i needed to do because you know i certainly couldn't outspend a lot of the established competitors who'd been trading for you know 20 30 years and had all that local reputation so i you know i had to i had to think smarter about about exactly what we did so I think, um, 
yeah, challenging time, worrying time, but I think it, it you know, we came through it in the end, a, a, a stronger business. Just, just going back to what you mentioned about moving, moving from Cheshire up to the northeast, and you mentioned that the agent at the time was, you know, doing a terrible job. What exactly was it that the agent, in your eyes, wasn't doing properly that made you add that glass of wine and going, oh, I could do a better job? What, what, what were they not doing that you weren't happy with? Or what it's, were they doing it, that you weren't happy with? Sorry. Um, you know, it, it's the classic pitfalls that that most, well, that many agents uh, do do find themselves to be guilty of poor communication i think was was the key thing you know not not letting us know you know if there was a problem and what they were doing about it you know us having to constantly chase them rather than being proactive and uh, and talking to us um one of the things which i made it an absolutely core pivotal part of our business because it really really rankled with me was you know thinking that they might not be acting fully with our best interests at heart um so i, I personally have got a big problem with agents who um will charge you a management fee and then stick a percentage on a contractor's invoice um in my view and you know i, I i've had debates with people on the internet and facebook all about this in the past you know some of which some of whom say that's all absolutely fine in my view you know, the management fee should reflect you running about dealing with the contractors, liaising with the tenants, getting the landlord's approval and all of that. Um, if you're then sticking another 10% on uh, on the contractor's invoice, or even worse, getting them to write you a check at the end of the month, then, you know, it does leave you open to, you know, potentially thinking, oh, I'm not having the greatest month here. Can I, um, can I perhaps do something with my contractors to... Uh, to perhaps replace any income that I need to make up. So, you know, we made that a selling point from day one. The fact that we would never, you know, put any markup on any contractor's invoices, you know, you will be able to see that with full transparency. Um, and I think that honest approach from day one, you know, set a really good grounding for, you know, then building the relationship with, with the landlords from there. So having an honest approach key, which is, you know, yeah, important communication, obviously important as well. And it's fair to say that from processes setting up the business, yeah, you know, as you said, franchising of being a franchisee, so you had the, the backing that you need to have, but you've also then identified a, a gap in the market as, as you would do with your background. You've identified the gap and gone, right, happy days, let's crack on, got everything set up, bit of an odd first 12 to 18 months because of economic conditions. Um, but from there, you went from strength to strength. And I'm guessing that over in the first 12 to 18 months, the reputation has built up. And you've then, by sussing out the competition, you've started looking at things that other agents are doing, going, mm, hang on a minute, mm. don't like that. Let's do it this way. And, and continuing down the same path. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, um, you know, one of the things going back, you, you touched on reputation, you know, I was very quick to jump on, you know, get getting Google reviews even before, you know, many years before people really picked up on it. So, you know, and, and I would systematically, and that's a key thing, systematically go about getting those reviews. So I wouldn't just leave it for, a you know, a landlord to wake up one morning and go, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write something nice about Neil. I would make it all part of the process so that, assuming everything had gone well, which, you know, 99 times out of 100 it had, you know, they would get an email with a link explaining exactly what they needed to do. And, and that led to us having, you know, tens of Google reviews when all of my competitors had, you know, you could count on one hand. Uh, and that made huge difference to, you know, search engine optimization and, and all the rest of it. But, you know, going back to the book, one of the things that I very quickly identified was that you know i'd come from a direct marketing background and that's you know that's not the fluffy stuff that's the marketing which is all concerned about getting someone to to do something um and you know i'd identified that all of the tried and tested best practices that seem to be established you know whether you were marketing chewing gum all the way through to super yachts there are some principles that just apply and pretty much all of those principles were being completely ignored when it came to, to advertising property, which just doesn't make sense. Because for most people, 
it's the biggest thing they will buy or sell. So, you know, it makes sense that if it's the biggest thing you'll buy or sell, it makes sense that it's actually advertised in the best possible way. Um, so instinctively, I, you know, our listings were, um, you know, you could tell our listings, even, you know, if you, if you put your hand over the right hand edge of the image and you couldn't see the logo in the way that we were writing them in the fact that we were absolutely, you know, focused on making sure the photography, because we just did lettings. And I think a lot of people go, oh, it'll do for lettings, which is a horrible attitude, which I hate. Um, but, uh, you know, the photos were, um, you know, were better than most of the sort of high end agents doing, you know, six bedroom mansions and all the rest of it. Uh, the way the actual listing copy was written, which is, you know, really where I could bring my direct marketing skills. Um, were written in a way that, you know, would appeal to the ideal tenant. Um, and nobody else was doing that. No, very few people, even now in, you know, 2021, very few people are doing it, which is hence the, the need for the book, really, to, to try and help people to, you know, to take all of those techniques which have worked for literally hundreds of years uh, and apply them to, to how they market their property. It wouldn't it be possible to um, hone in on a couple of examples there. Uh, you say if, if it's still 2021 and if people still aren't doing a lot of it now, uh, give us a couple of ideas of the sort of things that you would be doing that can separate you from the rest of the crowd. Um, well, you know, real obvious one. And, uh, you know, this would apply to, to lettings. But it, you know, I, I do say in the book, if you take one thing from the book, make it this one and it'll make a difference. So if you're advertising a property to let, do not lead with the external shot because tenants couldn't care less what it looks like from the outside. Buyers might care about the curb appeal. Tenants couldn't give two stuffs. So always lead with you know, the best internal photo, usually lounge or kitchen. Um, and that just doing that will make a big difference. Um, you know, that's not just me saying that. I closely followed research that right move put out and they put it out every single year they say that the three things that influence the click-through rate from the you know what appears in the in the summary search view to to clicking through to the full description are the photos the short description copy and the price so you know they've consistently said that for you know as long as of the, they've been publishing this so you know the photos are really really key just going with that internal shot for lettings will make a big difference when you get into the actual copy side of things um many many agents are wasting that opportunity that short description which is usually sort of four line current i mean right move change it slightly but you know, four, four lines, which appears in the whole list of, of properties when you do your search, that's vital to, to, to getting people clicking through. And so many agents waste that. One of the, the worst ways they can waste that is blah de blah estates are proud to be instructed and bring to the market this, which if you think you've got 250 characters, usually about 250 characters in those four lines, what I've just said there takes about 100. So actually, you've wasted over a third of you know, that opportunity to convince somebody to click through because you've got to be single-minded about it. The job of the summary view, what you see in the summary, is to get the click. The job of the full description and the, the full listing is to get the viewing. So, you know, you need to be that single minded about it. So, you know, if, if, if your ideal tenant or buyer scrolls right by, then, you know, nothing else happens. So, you know, you, you've got the, you know, you've got the price, the photos and the description to, to maximize your chance of, of getting that click. And, you know, agents just waste that. I saw, and actually I've got a, um, I've got a letter going out to the agent in question. Um, I saw a property that was on the market for three million quid very nice property um 
and the agent had one sentence of short description and you know so clearly that you know it took about a line and a half they've probably got you know another 140 150 characters that one sentence wasn't particularly interesting um this property uh, had in addition to being you know wonderfully grand with acreage had its own vineyard supplying you know, like 1200 to 1500 bottles of, of of chardonnay a year well as i've put them in the letter i'd be focusing on that you know want to own a house that comes with a vineyard well instead they just had some you know one bland line and it's just you know Okay, you could, I could see they'd invested in having a professional photographer and photos are really, really key. But, you know, clearly they, when it came to the other parts of the listing, they were fighting with one arm tied behind their back. That's, that's madness. I'll have a half of a vineyard. That's, I mean, what a selling point that is. Do you not need any more of, of, of an invitation there? Well, one thing that I talk about in the book, and I, and I think... Um, you know, when I am talking to agents, they will say, you know, if they are interested in, you know, working with me or getting my advice or getting me to write the copy for their listings, because I can do all that, you know, they'll say, oh, well, we'll, we'll give you all the, we'll give you all the high end stuff because, because really you can't do anything with, you know, anything but the high end stuff. And actually the, the reverse is, you know, is actually true because the high end stuff in some respects, you don't need me. It writes itself. As long as you're not that agent, that's you know missed the vineyard. Um, but uh, it's with the run of the mill stuff that actually having, you know, having compelling copy. It's compelling copy that that taps into the emotions because people don't buy a house because of how many bricks it's got or what the worktop surface is in the kitchen. They buy it because it fulfills an emotional need. And that is the crucial thing that you need to have in mind when you're writing a listing. It's what you need to have in mind, whether you're writing, you know, a press ad or a Facebook advert or anything. It, that, that's what separate, separates good marketing from run of the mill marketing, having that understanding of what the person is really buying. So, you know, an example which I use in the book is, um, you know, if you are, and I, th this is a real life example from, what I used to use in Sunderland. We um, had quite a large um, business park with call centers because everybody loves people from the Northeast accent. So um, there's a business park with lots of call centers, uh, typically employing, you know, 20 somethings. And um, nearby was an area of properties built in sort of 70, late 60s, 70s. Many of them houses, but they also had um, two bedroom flats, which we used to love renting out. The two bedroom flats, one of the key things about them was they had two comparably sized double bedrooms, which meant they were great for sharers. So the example that I use in the book and the example that I used for many years is, you know, could, could this two bedroom more side property be ideal to share with your Doxford International colleague? Because that's tapping into, you know, the need of what that 23 year old, you know, person who's working in the call center is actually looking for. They're looking for something where, you know, if they split the rent because they're about 500 a calendar month, it's costing them less than 250 quid. Crucially, what we pull out in the in the copy is, you know, it's got the two double bedrooms, which means that which is a crucial three words. You know, you don't have to argue about who gets the small bedroom because, you know, again, we've seen properties where uh, people have decided, you know, they've, they've seen the property, they've loved it. They've gone to the pub to discuss it and they go, oh, yeah, let's take it as long as I don't have that small bedroom. And it doesn't go forward. So, you know, it's 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 crafting the copy so that it's actually tapping into what that person's wanting you know i could have done something if if i had in mind that this person was currently living you know at home with their parents we could have had a headline about you know sick of creeping in at 11 o'clock at night fearful of waking your parents up because this flat will give you the independence you need something like that which makes the words jump off the page and what you want people to be doing is thinking that's me 99 percent of property listings don't do that and it, 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 
it's a it's a self fulfilling thing. Um, I've had you know various discussions with people in the Facebook groups. You know, people tend to fall into two two, two camps. That there's people who think the copy is is useful and beneficial and, and and makes a difference, and then there's the it's only the photos and the floor plans people. And um, you know, I've had discussions with with agents who've said you know the copy doesn't matter. I could write house in in the description and it wouldn't make any difference. Um, I really don't believe that, but the problem is it's a self-perpetuating thing. Those agents will say to their landlords and vendors or buyers and tenants, oh, do, do, you, read the, do you read the words? No, 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 it's all boring, cliched, means nothing to me, so I don't read it. Well, yeah, that's absolutely right. It is cliche, ridden, boring. It doesn't say anything to you. Uh -huh. But to me, that gives agents who take on board what I'm talking about the opportunity to, to rise themselves above their competition. And, you know, let's be honest, if the bar's bloody low, it doesn't take a lot to, <laughs> to actually make you look really, really good. And you need to think about it in terms of, you know, the listings, I've just been writing a, a blog post this morning about it, and I, I made the point. It's not just buyers and tenants that see the listings. The British are obsessed with property. You know, if you have a look at the right move stats, you know, a quarter of the population goes on right move at least once a year. And certainly there's not that many people moving. So, you know, I'm a strong believer in how you do one thing is how you do everything. So you can subtly communicate through your listing, your approach, you know, whether it's the photos, whether it's writing compelling, emotionally engaging copy, you know, if you're there bemoaning the fact that you're always competing on price, landlords and vendors choose on price because nobody's given them anything more interesting to choose on. Um, agents are really, really bad at differentiating themselves and, uh, you know, on a wider level, I help agents to do that because, you know, that then trickles down into, you know, not having to hustle every month to get the new leads in. If you actually create a point of differentiation, then, you know, people will seek, seek you out rather than the other way. It trickles down to fee in the sense that, you know, you will be able to justify having a higher fee. If you, if you get really into it, you can charge an even bigger fee for a sort of premium level product or service and cater that only to your most loyal landlords and vendors. And then it trickles down to, you know, the property management side of things rather than having a, a you know, a, a hassled, demotivated property management team who are, you know, sick of nightmare tenants. Well, focus on who your ideal tenants should be and then use those as the bait to to get the landlords and you know so i think the the listing is only a very small part of of what you can do to to basically create that point of differentiation but the thing which i think is so powerful about the listing is you don't need any more leads you've already got the instruction it, it, it baffles me that agents put so much focus on lead generation, winning the instruction, and then treat it so badly once they've got it. So, you know, it, rather than throwing another, you know, 500 quid a month, 1,000 pound a month or whatever to your lead gen to then convert a very small percentage of that, look at what's already in your window. And, you know, if, if you just convert an extra couple of percentage points of what you've already got, or if you're on a joint agency, if, if you convert it that bit quicker, it's going to make a massive difference to, you know, your bottom line at the end of the year. That was a bit of a rant. First thought that came into my head, and I, 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 I no, seriously, don't, don't worry about us. <clears throat> I think that's, that's packed with an insightful content. The thing that just sprang to my mind when you were talking about that was um, something that Tim Ferriss said a while ago when he was asked about podcast numbers, podcast listenership. And he says something along the lines of, I'm not really after, I'm, for him, it's not about how many downloads I'm getting or whatever. It's I'd rather have 100 people that I know that are pretty much going to buy off me every time I sell something or write a new book, rather than have a million people 
where you know 10 people might buy you know have have that loyal band of followers that's the first thing i was thinking about when you said mm. you know deal with what's on your doorstep and such rather than go out and create an x y and z uh, you probably yeah i mean I, I i completely agree i mean you you should if your marketing is any good and again you know it doesn't matter what you're marketing but we're talking about property so if you're marketing if your marketing is any good it should repel as many people as it attracts because otherwise you've, you've not got your head around who your ideal client or customer is and your message is not tailored to them. And not that I'm a great sort of search engine optimization expert. I'm, you know, I know a little bit about it, but, you know, writing a listing which has got, you know, keywords that your ideal buyer or tenant is searching for means, you know, people are faced with hundreds of properties that they've got to swipe through on, you know, on, on the various different portals. But, you know, if you craft your copy so that it addresses the real need that they're looking for, you know, looking for a three bedroom home in Gosforth Academy catchment area, you know, that will come up in the Google search because those, those people with a very specific need are more likely to be going outside of, you know, the standard portal keyword searches. So again, you're, you are identifying your, your ideal buyers and tenants. And again, far better to do three viewings for people who are absolutely bob on for, for, for that property rather than wasting your time doing 20 viewings for people who, you know, it was never going to be right for. So, you know, it can, it can have impact on, you know, on your efficiency in that way as well. That all makes perfect sense. And this going back to what you were saying, so you, that's right move saying it's the price it's a copy it's it's the pictures so that's mm -hmm. fine but then moving forward let's just say uh, I'm, I'm looking for a house in Sunderland uh, hypothetically uh, I'll go with that I do what I need to do um, ring you up book a view in etc is there anything then that agents can do on the day that help um well, I think those leads into sales. Um, well, good communication is is absolutely key. But I think one of the key things, um, which is covered in a, in a fantastic book by um, Robert Cialdini, it's a book called uh, Persuasion. Many people might have heard of his first book, which is called Influence. Um, Persuasion, as the the title suggests talks about how you can influence somebody's decision prior to the point of making the decision. So the listing in the way that it's written can gently change what the potential ven uh, the potential buyer or tenant is actually thinking about because you've got you've got you know, hours, days, or, or sometimes even weeks between them, you know, seeing the listing and actually having the viewing. And what Cialdini says in Persuasion is that it's, it's hard to change what somebody thinks. It's much easier to change what they think about. So the way that you actually create the listing could be focusing on clearly the key things of the property. And, and basically, you've got all that time between them, book, you know, seeing the listing, booking the viewing and actually turning up at the property to have stuff, you know, floating around in the subconscious, getting them excited about, you know, what they will eventually get when they set, you know, step through the door. So, you know, that that's that's a, a, a very powerful and some might start, you know, some might question it's all psychological woo, -woo stuff, but it's researched and it does actually stack up. You know, so you you can you can be getting people to think more favorably about what you want them to be thinking about, um, and less about any potential shortcomings of of the property. And I think the key thing there is focusing, as I mentioned earlier, on you know what is the emotional change. What what you know they're going to go from A to B. You know what what is the real reason. That, you know that they're not spending 500 pounds a month or spending you know 160,000 pounds to get a tight you know title deeds or, or a tenancy agreement it, it, it's going to be you know moving them from either towards 
pleasure or away from pain. And those are two key things you need to identify. Are they, you know, are they wanting to, you know, move to walking distance of lovely, you know, pavement cafes so they can sit on a Saturday morning with a coffee and watch the world go by? Or, you know, are they in a tiny little flat and, you know, they, they need extra space? So, you know, it's, it's, it's using the listing to focus their attention on, you know, what's ultimately important to them. So aside from that, what you can do beforehand, um, you know, going back to one of the original observations, communication is absolutely key. Um, I think there are few agents who, um, who communicate enough. Um, you know, so again, it, you are in control of the process in the sense that, you know, you're running your diary. I mean, I know you've got certain sites which will integrate with the diaries and let people sort of book in. But, you know, essentially you're, you, you should be in control of your diary. And just like, you know, I'm in control of my diary and, you know, there may be good reasons that if someone wants to meet with me tomorrow, um, I might not say that I'm available until, you know, following Thursday or something like that, because, you know, it, subconsciously, someone thinks oh well right you know he's got nothing better you know he's got nothing else in his diary tomorrow morning how, you know how good is he how how uh, you know how busy is he so you know you've got control to you know to, to make the viewing when you want it to be obviously if someone's only in your area this afternoon and then you know they're not going to return again you need to be accommodating to that but assuming that's not the case if you then want to buy yourself as a system, you know, if you want to buy yourself 24 hours, 48 hours to allow you to sort of pre-communicate to the buyer or the, or the tenant, then you should do that because, you know, the, the systems these days, you know, all the email autoresponders, MailChimp and all the rest of it, you can start to communicate with them, both about you as an agency or about the property so that, you know, you are managing their expectations about, you as an agency or the property, you know, prior to them actually getting there, you know, at three o'clock on a, on a Tuesday afternoon. So I think a lot of agents don't really realize that and they're all a bit too reactive. And um, as I say, there, there is, there are sound reasons why sometimes you, you do have to throw the rules out and go, yeah, okay, I'm jumping in the car now. I'll, I'll come down and let you in. But otherwise you control the process. So, you know, that's immediately someone books the viewing, they get an email or a text or a phone call 12 hours, 24 hours later, they might get something else on the morning of the viewing, they might get something else. All of which is just building that bond, building that rapport. And the same applies to, you know, even more so for um, if you're booking in, you know, appraisals or valuations, you know, you, you absolutely should be making the most of the time but between that conversation and when you actually turn up at the door you know so that's controlling that process to give you the time to if you've got you know a series of four emails that go out send a series of four emails if you've got a nice sort of direct mail pack that arrives in a bright orange envelope or something like that give yourself the time to send that um so i think that that, that pre-communication is, is vital, again, for differentiating yourself. And, and you're also, by doing that, creating those various touch points as well, which will create a, f a sense of familiarity as well, which will probably stand you ahead of the competition, I imagine, which just works to your advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the one thing, and I know it's sort of, it's a very broad brush statement, but, um, a lot of agents out there are, are not are not great at this sort of thing. So again, you know, as I said before, you know, in, in the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. You, you don't have to be that great, really, to, to be noticeably better than the vast majority of your competition. But I think the, the key thing is, you know, and I, I, you know, I'm mindful of the fact that I've got a very, very short attention span. Um, you know, consistency is key. There's no, there's no good being fantastic for a week and then um, never doing anything again. That's why you've, you know, you've got to be consistent as what you, what you do. 
because then you know you become known for it um reputation is is you know repetition builds reputation so you know just consistently doing the same thing over and over again is is absolutely vital perfect stuff uh, i'll be honest now looking at you know the key things that you've gone through uh, in the episode we've you know discussed about the book discussed about setting up a lettings agency discussed about the, the three the, the key things that most agents or, or managing agents are not doing and then you've instructed people on how they can change that i guess before we wrap up and say how do people contact you and how do people go ahead and purchase the book is there anything else that you think that you haven't mentioned that you should mention to the benefit of people listening to this no i i, I think it's really simple you know I, I i think it all comes from the premise of you know you need to create something about your agency or something about your property you know applying it to you know individual self-managing people you need to create something that sets you apart from the competition um that can be quite daunting if you don't know how to do it but you know the first point must be to get you know a really deep understanding of of who you're marketing to and and most most agents and most landlords don't do that once you have that understanding everything else becomes a damn sight easier um so you know it would be you know, a really really valuable use of time to actually sit down and think you know whether you've got two bedroom flat four bedroom detached or you've got an estate agency or letting agency you know who you know, with every single piece of communication who is it you're communicating to and and what is the message that you want to to give them because i think one of the key pitfalls that 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 people fall into is when they think about marketing they inevitably think about the media the tactics you know oh i'm doing facebook ads oh i'm doing leaflets oh i'm doing a press ad that that is just the means with which you get the message out there if your message is terrible doesn't matter what what media you're using it's not going to work so you need to the, the message is far more important than the media and and that message only comes it only gets you know becomes right and strong and powerful if you have a deep understanding of who you're talking to that is a absolutely great place to finish the episode i think that's uh, very poignant i would say you know as just mentioned if people wanted to get in touch with you uh, purchase the ultimate property listing how do people do that uh, so Ultimate Property Listing is on Amazon. So you can get it as a paperback, you can get a Kindle. And just as of last week, um, the audio book read by my good self is, is live. Um, you can also get it direct from my website, um, a little bit cheaper, actually. I'm, uh, I'm doing one of those free with shipping offers. So um, if you go to my website, well, I've got neilwhitfield.com website where you can find out a little bit more about me and i've also got the ultimate property listing.com um if you go to the ultimate property listing.com you can get the book for free you just pay 4.99 shipping which saves you a couple of quid compared to getting it from amazon uh why do i do that because that way you come into my email system so i can communicate with you and email you and share lots of knowledge and insights. So um, yeah, I would point people towards you know Amazon, neilwhitfield.com or ultimatepropertylisting.com. Perfect stuff. And as usual, we will put those links in the show notes uh, for podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, apologies for the flashing shirt. I don't know why that's been happening. And also uh, those links we'll put in the description below. Uh, Neil, well, wonderful stuff, impactful. I think that's going to make a big difference to a lot of people that listen to that. Uh, a massive thank you for your time today. Loved it. Thanks very much, Rob.